Morton Kondracki is a senior editor of The New Republic, a TV panelist for the McLaughlin Group, and moderator of the PBS weekly program, American Interests. He's also a frequent guest on the McNeil Lair News Hour, NBC's Meet the Press, and CBS's Face the Nation. Let's welcome Morton Kondracki. <laughs> also joining us for this debate is Christopher Hitchens, a columnist for The Nation, Washington editor of Harper's, and a book critic for Newsday. He's reported from Israel, Turkey, Lebanon, and many other countries. He's co-editor with Edward Said of Blaming the Victims, Spurious Scholarship and the Palestinian Question, and the author of Blood, Class, and Nostalgia, Anglo-American Ironies, Christopher Hitchens. Now, just a word about the program tonight. We're going to start with opening summaries uh, from each of our two guests of approximately 15 minutes each. We'll then have a short period of exchange of 10 or 15 minutes, and then hopefully at about halfway through the program, we're going to open up the forum to your questions. So if you have questions that you think of during the forum, write them down and we'll get to them. Probably we're aiming for around 8.30 or so. The topic once again is, was the Gulf War a just war? We're going to open the discussion with Morton Kondraki, who will answer in the affirmative. Mr. Kondraki. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, those of you who watch the McLaughlin Group with any regularity will know that I'm delighted to be anywhere that I can finish a sentence without getting interrupted. Uh, uh, some people say that the McLaughlin group is unbalanced to the right, and I'm here to confess that that's, that that's true. I am, the, I am the voice of sweet reason, moderation, uh, good sense, uh, calm, and uh, quiet, and uh, resolve, all virtues. And we have uh, on, the, on the right, as you know, Pat Buchanan, who uh, is so far to the right that he didn't come to really love Richard Nixon until after Watergate. Uh, <laughs> there's Fred Barnes, uh, also on the right. Fred and I are colleagues at the New Republic, as many of you probably know. And we were having a discussion one day about, uh, about the homeless, or at least I thought I was talking about the homeless, and he thought I meant Ferdinand and Yamelda Marcos. Um, and then on the left, uh, supposedly on the left, we have Eleanor Clift and, uh, and Jack Germond, although uh, in order to really, if this were a teeter-totter, to balance off uh, uh, Buchanan and Barnes, uh, Eleanor would have to be as left as Ho Chi Minh, and uh, Germond would have to be as heavy as King Kong. Um, and uh, they're not. They're working on it, each of them in his own way, in her own way, but uh, they're not quite there yet. Uh, there is one alternative. Instead of either of them, we could have Christopher Hitchens, uh, who, uh, as, a, as a left winger, if you can stand that sort of thing, uh, Christopher is a par excellence uh, and without parallel. Uh, my purpose uh, is to argue the positive side, that the war in the Gulf was a just war, and I'm going to do that. But um, I want to say that this is not the same as saying that George Bush's policy uh, was right in every regard. Uh, prior to August 2nd, the Bush administration pursued an odious policy of appeasement toward Saddam Hussein. Um, it ignored the, uh, the, the Bush, Bush Reagan administrations, uh, didn't give him arms, as it's often alleged, but, uh, but allowed arms to flow to him, weapon, weaponry, um, provided him with intelligence. Uh, ignored the fact that uh, that he uh, was uh, butchering the Kurds, and and in essence tilted politically in, in his direction. And right up to the end of uh, right up to the invasion of Kuwait, uh, basically uh, ignored ignored the threat. And in fact, uh, in testimony uh, a couple of days before the the actual invasion, said that uh, in effect it was none of our business uh, what Saddam Hussein might want to do. At the moment, the Bush administration is pursuing an even more odious policy uh, of basically allowing Saddam Hussein to massacre 
uh, tens of thousands of Kurds and Shiites and, uh, and averting its eyes. And these are people that we, in effect, uh, encourage to rebel against Saddam Hussein. Um, what we should be doing is, I, I submit, carrying on what was a just war and, at a minimum, shooting down Saddam Hussein's fixed-wing aircraft and attack helicopters using all the influence that we've, that we've gained in the United Nations and in the rest of the world in order to, uh, to apply whatever political pressures we can uh, to Saddam Hussein's regime uh, in order to, to get him to stop, but, but using, the military, using the military weapons that we have. Um, I think that the dismal record of the Bush administration before and after in a way supports the point that what occurred between August 2nd and the end of February was not a war of aggression on our part, uh, was, was not an imperialist war, was not a war that we provoked, uh, but was a just war, an attempt to reverse aggression, uh, to prevent the domination of, the, of that region and one of the world's great treasures, namely 40% uh, of the world's oil reserves, by a monster. Now, the idea of a just war, as you undoubtedly know, has a history. It, it, is, it is a Christian history from St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. Now, Augustine's rules were that you should lament the necessities of just wars rather than glory in them, uh, that peace should be the object of your desire, uh, that war should be waged only as a necessity, and waged only that God may by it deliver men from the emergency and preserve them in peace. Now, Aqu Aquinas systematized uh, this into several conditions. One, that the person who wages war, or the country that wages war, must have the authority to do so. Two, that it must be a just cause, that is, usually to defend oneself or, or a, another uh, country or people from attack. Three, that the war must be carried out uh, with the right intention. Um, of advancing the good and achieving peace in the long run. And his, uh, Aquinas' followers later added a fourth, that it must be carried out with appropriate means. And there's a, a kind of a fifth adjunct, a rule of just war, that, um, that it, generally speaking, be undertaken only as the last res resort. Now, among religious thinkers, um, the case, uh, contemporary religious thinkers, uh, the case is all against me. Pope John Paul denounced this war. Uh, the Catholic bishops all denounced the war. Uh, most of the mainline Protestant churches denounced the war, um, fundamentally saying that, the, that uh, we didn't exhaust every possible alternative to it, that diplomacy wasn't exhausted, that we should have tried sanctions for a longer time. Um, I, think, I think they're wrong in, in this respect. And I think that in the case of the Protestants particularly, uh, and, and some of the Catholics, that there is really a hidden... Uh, theology here of, of pacifism and, um, and, uh, the, and the pacifist, seriously, that there, there is no war, that there is no war that is justified. Now, if you believe, <laughs> fine, fine, that, that it may be the case that no war is justified, but consider the consequences of, of such a policy. The consequences are that thugs will rule the world, that, that those that those who are strong and willing to resort to force, as 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 in the as in a in a situation uh, in a in a criminal situation, uh, those those who are willing to resort to force get to do it, and nobody is nobody is around to stop them. And let's be clear: Saddam Hussein is a thug, uh, a demonstrated thug, and there is no and there is no comparison. Those of you who believe in moral equivalence between him and us or him and the Kuwaitis. People poo-poo the Hitler analogy, uh, overdrawn, you know, uh, way out of line. And it's true that he has not attempted to systematically commit genocide against anybody, although he has, ha has practically committed genocide against the Kurdish people uh, in his own country, uh, decimating the population, driving them out of their lands, using poison gas against them, uh, and so on. This, this is the kind, of, uh, the kind of character he is. Furthermore, along the line of the Hitler analogy, um, and this is, these are not things that happen in the United States of America, nor are they the kinds of things that happen under our aegis, as, uh, nor are they the kinds of things that happen in Kuwait. Now, now get this book. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, 
it's a history of the of of the time. It's got an appendix from Middle East Watch, which is no uh, right wing organization. Um, the report of Middle East Watch on Saddam Hussein says, in part, and I, w I, w I won't, I could read this at length and, and chill your spines, but I won't. Uh, large numbers of persons have unquestionably died under torture in Iraq over the past two decades. Each year there have been reports of dozens, sometimes hundreds of deaths with bodies of victims uh, at times left in the street or returned to their families bearing marks of torture, eyes gouged out, fingernails missing, genitals cut off, and terrible wounds and burns. The brazenness of Iraqi authorities in returning bodies bearing clear evidence of torture is remarkable. Governments that engage in torture often go to great lengths to hide what they've done by burying or destroying the bodies of those tortured to death. A government so savage as to flaunt its crimes obviously wants to strike terror in the hearts of its citizens and to inflict gratuitous pain on the families of its victims. That, that is, no, I'm sorry, that's in Iraq. Now, now, face the fact that you're dealing here, that you're dealing here with somebody who has butchered tens of thousands of his, of his own people. Uh, what's more, he is, and he is an expansionist, he has an expansionist, had an expansionist uh, ideology, which he stated um, before, uh, before an Arab audience last February, and it, there was a, a, a theory behind it that the Soviet Union is no longer a superpower, that there's only one superpower left in the world, and that's the United States, and it will have its way in the world until the Japanese and the Germans, thanks to their superior economic performance, can contain us, and that in the interim, it is up to somebody to contain the United States, and guess who he wanted to do it but himself, uh, by using the oil weapon. But not merely by using oil, but by using the fruits of oil to equip himself with, with military um, might in order to intimidate his neighbors who could then, uh, and, and to uh, control, control their oil supplies. Um, he, has, he has used the weapons that, he, that he's had at his command. Uh, he, he instituted the war against Iran. Uh, there were a million casualties in that war. It lasted for eight years. And then he attacked Kuwait, a, def a fundamentally defenseless country. Um, now, it's very fashionable to say that Kuwait is, a, is an emirate. What's an emirate? Um, uh, absolute monarchy, uh, that it doesn't allow women to vote, that it, um, that it suspended its constitution, that it uh, uh, closed its na national assembly. But in fact, the pe people who know the Middle East region know that in a region where there are very few democracies, practically none, Kuwait was headed further in that direction than, than any other country. It did have a National Assembly at one point. That the National Assembly and the Constitution were closed down amidst uh, terrorism during the Iran-Iraq War. But as of 1990, they were beginning to have vigorous debates inside again about establishing the, the Sabah family as a, as a constitutional monarchy. And they're headed back in that direction now that we've, now that we've won the war. The progress toward democracy in, in Kuwait was interrupted by Saddam's invasion. Uh, what he conducted was not a, was not a, a bargaining uh, endeavor, not to get islands that he might you know lease or something like that. This was a war of aggression, of takeover, of annihilation. Uh, he, de he decimated the country as a country, took away all its population records, tried to create a, a, a puppet government, failed because he couldn't get any Kuwaitis who would who would be his puppets, uh, and so he um, he essentially trashed the place. The United States did not provoke the invasion, uh, did, not provo did not go to war because we wanted to go to war. Quite the contrary. We failed to see it coming. Uh, we tried to get along with the guy. We appeased the guy at, at every turn. Um, it was only after August 2nd that we finally bestirred ourselves to do anything about it. Um, and what we did was to first try sanctions. We went, we followed all the rules that you could possibly uh, uh, muster. We went to the United Nations. Uh, we passed uh, six resolutions uh, before there was a there was a resolution against uh, uh, calling for the use of force. Ultimately, the use of force was was passed by the constitutional authorities of the United States of America, namely the Congress of the United States, in a in a free and open vote. Um, we got basically everybody in the world um, uh, going along with us. We were we were. We had Arab allies, people in the region, um, and our sole demand at the beginning, our sole demands were two, that he get out of Kuwait and restore the original government. 
Now, uh, diplomacy was tried. Uh, the President of France went to, to see him. Um, the Secretary General of the United Nations went to see him. Uh, James Baker was prepared to go see him. Instead, there was a meeting with the foreign minister and James Baker in which the, the subject of withdrawing from Kuwait never was raised by the, um, by the Iraqi foreign minister. Diplomacy was tried. Now, the question, now the, the Christopher, I'm sure, and lots of other people who are against the war will say, well, sanctions were really never given a chance and we'll never know whether sanctions would have worked or not. But look at what it took to get the guy even to consider withdrawing from Kuwait. Five weeks of the heaviest bombing that we've had since World War II, the onset of a ground invasion, and then finally he would agree um, to get out of Kuwait. My, my um, uh, proposition to you is that sanctions might have worked in 10 years, 15 years, um, sometime in the, in, the, in, in the next century they presumably would have worked. And opposition to the war never had a deadline, never suggested a, a contrary deadline. All they, were, all they were interested in is punting uh, the issue down the road and, and never coming to terms with, um, with Saddam Hussein. Now, um, what we, there, was, there was a hidden motive involved here on the part of many of us who favored the war. I, I can't say that it was George Bush's hidden motive. It certainly was my hidden motive. It was not my, I hoped that, 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 the, uh, that the outcome of this would be as it was the destruction of the military potential of Saddam Hussein. Um, he had demonstrated that he was willing to use his military potential. Um, he had killed hundreds of thousands of people in the past. Uh, I wanted to see that military potential destroyed, which included nuclear weapons uh, somewhere down the line, a chemical arsenal, which he had already used, uh, missiles, um, and, um, and the guy represented a, a menace to the region, and, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm delighted that that military potential was, was destroyed. I think this was a peace aim in the, in the context of just war theory. Now, there are two, two other subjects, uh, one I've covered about sanctions. The other question is the methods. Were our methods proportionate to the task? Um, you will hear estimates that 100,000 Iraqis were killed in the process of winning this war and tens of thousands of civilians were killed in the process of winning this war. Those numbers have, have no um, verification to them. Now, I believe that tens of thousands of Iraqi soldiers were killed. I deeply regret that so many were killed. The idea that tens of thousands of civilians were killed, it seems to me, is implausible. Saddam, now wait a minute, just a second. Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein had the television networks of the world there in Baghdad, was carting them around from place to place, uh, showing them what he described as purposeful attempts on our part to, to kill civilians. Um, every, every piece of evidence that anybody has mustered suggests that where we killed civilians, we did it by accident. Uh, w just a minute. We did it by accident. We, didn't, we did it by accident. All you have to do is look at the way the, the military briefers handled the issue of the, of the the bunker that, that got bombed in, in um, downtown Baghdad, where maybe 500 people were killed, right? That's the biggest case we know of, of, of mass destruction of civilians. And it was clearly an accident. There was military camouflage on the roof. Uh, it's, it's been demonstrated that there was. Our pilots thought that this was something else other than it, what it was. We did not go seeking out these people knowing that there were civilians there to bomb them. We took extraordinary measures to avoid civilian casualties and had there been the kind of numbers of civilian casualties that Saddam Hussein claimed there was and opposition to the war claimed there was, believe me, Peter Arnett would have broadcasted all over CNN and he did not. Um, okay, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, I think that probably that, that, that we overbombed military targets in, in, uh, in Kuwait and in Iraq. We killed more military people than we needed to kill. We didn't, we, we didn't want more military people than we needed to kill. We didn't, we, we didn't want 
to kill americans because we thought when it was a ground invasion that there might that that we might lose tens of thousands of americans so we overdid it with a bombing but does this does this make this not a just war i submit to you that there have been far worse cases in just wars of of purposeful killing of civilians and i and i'm not saying that there was purposeful killing of civilians in the second world war in hiroshima and nagasaki in dresden and and uh, hamburg they were purposeful killings of tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of civilians that did not make world war ii not a just war it was a just war sherman destroyed everything from atlanta to the sea in the civil war i submit to you that the civil war was a just war and i submit to you that this war too was a just war christopher one quick note before we move on to Mr. Hitchens. Uh, remember that after the two summarizing statements, there'll be a period of exchange between the two uh, speakers. Uh, that will start off with a question by Mr. Hitchens for Mr. Kondraki. They'll have uh, five or ten minutes to discuss that and then reverse it. Question from Mr. Kondraki to Mr. Hitchens. Uh, first, though, the second summary from Mr. Hitchens. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. I might go as far as to say comrades and friends for coming and showing by your presence that it isn't true that Americans are either apathetic or mindlessly joyous about the present state of affairs. Since, as it must now be apparent, the rubric of our discussion this evening could just as well be or have been, is the Gulf War a just war? Since it is, as we told you, it would be still going on and will be going on for some considerable time. For those of you who say to yourselves or have said it to you by others, well, you feel better for having gone through it this far. Your morale is higher, your confidence in your country greater, your feeling about yourself superior and so on. One hears this, one never hears anyone say it about themselves, only about others. Suggestive, but like drug taking. Um, <laughs> but that uh, public opinion is, after all, what everyone thinks everybody else believes. Um, but to those who might think, yes, we do feel better about ourselves, stronger, surely, more confident, undoubtedly, uh, for this, I want to ask, how did you feel before, in that case, that it should have taken this to uh, put that spring in your step, that bounce in your buggy, that jauntiness in your, uh, in your speech. Because this is serious stuff. And I can't match, I'm envious, I should say, I, I, about not being able to, I can't match Mort in his television uh, opening shtick. I mean, I'm, I'm a much more humble performer than I'm hoping to overtake and uh, surpass him. My contribution in the Gulf War was principally there came a point when CNN got to H in the Rolodex of people at the bottom of the barrel they hadn't yet asked about. As a result, I found myself having a lunchtime debate with Charlton Heston, <laughs> who says that, who did not say that um, missiles don't kill people, people kill people, I'm glad to say. Um, in my fact, I think he lost because he didn't realize it was a look-alike contest. But I did take the liberty of asking him if he could name counterclockwise the countries that uh, have common borders with Iraq. And uh, I wanted to ask him because I wanted to ask the viewers, since those of you who favor the unloading of that amount of high explosive on a country, I think owe it the compliment of knowing where it is. Even if you don't care that it is a society as well as a country, I think you must at least incline uh, in favor of its geography. Charlton Heston said he thought it had common borders with Bahrain and the Soviet Union. <laughs> no Arab country has a border with the Soviet Union. Bahrain is notorious, among other things, for being an island. It's <laughs> the pristine integrity of the borders of Bahrain needs no guarantee from General Schwarzkopf. The restless oceans itself guarantee this. Now, now that some people think it's over, which I'm going to argue that it is not, we hear from from philosophers not uh, Augustinian or Thomist, but Gingrichian, <laughs> that those of us who thought it was a bad idea owe you an apology. Well, what did we tell you would happen if George Herbert Walker Bush got his way? 
we said there would be appalling environmental devastation on a scale in the oil world at any rate hitherto unimagined we said there would be casualties of a sort to turn even the stout stomach of Richard Cheney we said there would be an appalling political destabilization of the region one that would be long-term and difficult to control or predict we said there would at home be the aggrandizement of a redundant military industrial establishment that had lost its place in its way with the end of the Cold War and we said there would be a giant diversion from the real issues of the new Europe the newly emancipated Eastern Europe and the terrible divisions between rich and poor in the Arab world and everywhere else that's what we said would happen and we should apologize I repudiate this offer there is only one alteration I would make I think as I survey the list of our predictions there's only one codicil I would add when we said that there would be horrendous casualties we probably overstated the number we thought would be American but we definitely understated the number that we thought would be Iraqi and I hope you ladies and gentlemen don't want it said about you that the casualties don't count if they're not American and I hope that you would find a hundred thousand uniformed Iraqis and I'll come to the figures that Morton contests in just a second and an uncounted but very considerable number of civilian Iraqis a very high price no matter what you think of the price you would pay for the rescue of George Bush's face valuable face worth a life or two come on what do you reckon five thousand lives to save that face ten who's counting in this case nobody's counting the reason why the hundred thousand figure is the ballpark figure is this that's what General Schwarzkopf's people told the Wall Street Journal they thought was the minimum they said if you want the ballpark figure it's between a hundred and two hundred thousand the mortuary platoons as they are called moved in very quickly as they had to with bulldozers as they had to to cover up as fast as they could not all of that was cover up cover up so it was just for God's sake you can't leave them rotting we'll never really know but that's a hundred thousand right there on the southern front and remember we had no quarrel with the Iraqi people oh dear me no remember that was the constituent of the just war our quarrel isn't with them well there are at least a hundred thousand on that front alone to whom that point need no longer be made let us move then to the northern front where there were no reporters where we had to rely instead on the Kurdish Democratic Party Jamal Talabani's party party now aligned with the Bush administration or at least until yesterday it was when it found out the Bush administration isn't aligned with it but anyway when it was so aligned it had observers monitoring the bombing and I'll tell you exactly what they told the Defense Department and what appeared on the front page of the Washington Post in December they said in this province of Kurdistan just this province one province on the Turkish border where our fighters have been standing on high places and buildings to watch the bombing we think only 3,000 civilians have died as collateral damage but we consider the sacrifice worth it because the Americans will bring us an independent Kurdish Republic well they had some excuse for being fooled ladies and gentlemen you don't have that excuse if you don't want to know that in that one province of Kurdistan according to America's imagined allies or rather those who imagined America to be their allies that 3,000 grim though it was and in a grim province was thought worthwhile that week for the sacrifice for the birth of a nation yes but for the sacrifice for George Bush's face I think not and that's one province one week you don't really want to know face it I don't really want to know how many people but what we do know is that every effort is made to keep the estimate low and the lowest estimates are appalling now to borrow from the ridiculous Hitler analogy it is as if the citizens of Dresden had been murdered and the Fuhrer had been confirmed in power who would then say Dresden was the evidence of a just war who would dare come out and say that the incineration of a population and the consecration of its dictator in the name of which the incineration took place was the proof of justice because the president said so who would have the face to tell you that is there anyone you know who you could look in the eye and say that to over the ruins of Dresden and Kurdistan do you want to read Samir Halil's piece is there anyone you know who you could look in the eye and say that to over the ruins of Dresden and Kurdistan 
Do you want to read Samir Halil's piece in the New York Review of Books this uh, week? He's the principal moral author of the books from which Kondraki quotes. He was the principal moral author of the State Department's propaganda on Iraq. He's the principal Iraqi moral author of all the op-ed pieces and essays about the fascist nature of the Saddam Hussein regime. And do you know what he says this week in the New York Review of Books? He gives a description of Baghdad. It's a city from which human life has been taken out. The water doesn't run. The electricity doesn't run. The hospitals are finished. The schools closed. The bodies unburied in the streets. This, the prime Iraqi supporter of the war. And he says, furthermore, and echoes the United Nations Commission report, which says that in the aftermath, because the, the dying isn't over yet, the United Nations report chaired by Marty Artisari, a very distinguished Finnish diplomat, says that the conditions are apocalyptic. He means that literally. There are four horsemen, if you remember. The two still to come, naturally created by a bombing campaign that takes out the reservoirs, that takes out the sewage, that takes out the hospitals and the electricity, famine and pestilence. Those are next. Those are the next two horsemen. And Khalil says all this, and he says, this had better have been worth it. This had better have been worth it. I, as an Iraqi, thought this war might have been worth fighting. If the administration has done it simply to rearrange Iraqi internal affairs to suit the priorities of the Bush administration, this will be one of the greatest betrayals of the century and also one of the greatest mass murders. And do you notice something? When was the last time you heard a member of the administration say they were going to have a war crimes trial? They dropped Nuremberg, didn't they? It was good enough for you, fucking idiots as you're supposed to be, consumers and spectators of politics to be marched to war in the name of human rights and told there would be a war crimes trial for the guilty at the end. Good enough for you. You'll buy anything. You're supposed to swallow anything, like your congressman and the editors of your newspapers and the producers of your talk shows. And you bought that. And now, dead silence on war crimes trials. Dead silence on human rights. There isn't a member of the Bush administration who dare to mention the subject because war has been made en masse on civilians they can't bury fast enough. And that's the situation. Now, what, do you want to remember what the excuses were for this? Morton was good enough to give most of them. The truth is the following. This is the fourth change of side the United States administration has made in a 3,000-year-old conflict between Iran and Iraq that was going on before Bush was born and would be going on after he's dead. In um, 1973, Henry Kissinger went to Tehran and arranged with the Shah of Iran and with the Israeli military intelligence, the Mossad, to try and destabilize the regime of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And the decision was to do this by proxy, by supporting a Kurdish revolt in northern Iraq. <coughs> Money and weapons were set aside. The thing was done. The budget was authorized by Nixon. You have to go and read the Pike Commission report, Congressman Pike's report on, of the House Intelligence Committee to see what happened. Some of you may know it already. The Commission found that the uh, Kurds had been given only enough money to keep fighting, only enough weapons to keep fighting, had been told deliberately that they were being encouraged to fight for their independence, but had been not told, also deliberately, that they weren't going to get the resources to do that, that they were to be used as, as cannon fodder. And when the Shah of Iran, then also our proxy, and Saddam Hussein made their peace on their own border, the Kurds were dropped the same day. And you can read then the reports of the anguish of the Kurds at finding they'd been betrayed. This is from 75. And it's all in the Pike Commission report, and you've got no excuse not to know it. George Bush hasn't got any reason not to know it either, because just as that was happening, he became director of central intelligence. So this is an old story, right? But a few years later, it's all changed. Our proxies have lost power in Persia. Tehran is no longer ours. In this case, the anti-Americanism is directed in another tone of voice. So what happens? Ask Gary Sick, who was the National Security Council officer for Persia and the Gulf at the time. He'll tell you. Brzezinski and others went to Saddam Hussein and said, if you were ever thinking of invading Iran, and we know you have thought about it in your time, now might not be all that bad a time to do it, actually. Uh, up to you entirely, of course, but I mean, if you felt like doing it, we here, in fact, our intelligence says their army's in bad shape and they're low on spare parts. Only we can sell them to them, you see, something they later did do. 
Anyway, if you were thinking of doing it, um, in your name, with your money, without your permission, never mind, never mind. They'll think of a reason afterwards. So Saddam Hussein did do that. And I don't think anyone went to the UN and said, this won't stand. The Iraqi army invaded uh, Persia in strength and deep and violently. No, nothing at the UN. No cry about Hitlerian aggression. No, because the definition of a Hitlerian aggression is one we don't decide upon. A freelance one, a random one, one that hasn't been cleared with us, that's Hitlerism. One that has been cleared, that's fine. <laughs> and it's not good enough. Not good enough when you think of the thousands and thousands of young Arabs and Persians who died on that distinction and are not being told it by cynics of the sort. You know the rest. You know how the tilt went back the other way to Iraq. You know how the tilt is now in the opposite direction, that we've fought this war in part to make Iran the master of the Gulf again. You know all that. You knew all that before. This was the design, scribbled frantically, suddenly, hastily, in an improvised manner, scribbled deep by idiots across the whole face of Mesopotamia, an ancient society and culture that's now been bombed back into the Stone Age, that's been made into a third world country and that may face the most appalling outbreaks, not just of famine and pestilence, but of fundamentalism, fanaticism and sectarian bloodshed, like Kuwait, the fires that needn't have started, but uh, will be very, 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 very hard to put out. And there was only one achievement of Saddam Hussein that ever justified the administration's indulgence towards him when it was indulgent. It was a modernizing regime. It did not employ the veil. It allowed the practice of all religions. It didn't rule in the name of any saint. And it was developing an infrastructure for the country. That was the only good thing you could ever say about the, the neo-fascistic character of the Ba'athist regime. That at least it was a modernizing one and that at least it was secular. And that is the one thing that the bombing has been guaranteed to destroy. And remember also that the appalling bombing of Kuwait and the incredible massacre of the retreating Iraqi soldiers that you saw on the television and the torching of the oil wells all took place after the 21st of February, the day on which directly through United Nations and Soviet mediation announced publicly in Moscow, Iraq accepted every relevant United Nations resolution. That wasn't good enough. Imperialism demands and the face of George Bush demands, you can't withdraw now. We have to push you out. And every bit of death and destruction that came after that, including the sabotage of the oil wells and the fantastic massacre at Mutla, the unbelievable turkey shoot bloodshed uh, done from the sky, is directly layable to those who insisted on this being a point of American prestige. And there's no justice or pride or decency in that. And we will be paying the price for it for a very long time to come. Now, I have the sense that I'm trespassing on the limits of my time, and I have more to say. And I imagine that people like yourselves come to meetings like this as much to talk as to listen. At least I hope so. But what we'll, I'll close simply by saying this. What we have now that, to his credit, surprises and depresses Morton. Actually, it's not to his credit that it surprises him, but it is to his credit that it depresses him. Suddenly find it wasn't a war for the democracy of Iraq or indeed the democratization of Kuwait. After all, American soldiers are standing there in Kuwait with the power to stop pogroms and reprisals and are not doing so. And the Army Corps of Engineers didn't surely have to have as its first duty the reconstruction of the Dazman Palace of the Al Sabah family. This isn't mandated by history. And if Storm in Norman is as good as all that, there's no reason why soldiers wearing American uniforms should stand with folded arms while this sort of thing goes on. But let it pass. The American army is still in Iraq. What's it doing in Iraq? It's wondering what it should be doing while Hitler lives and Dresden burns. And what they're thinking is this. Actually, if you think about it, if we define Saddam as a weakened, crippled Hitler, haven't we got more or less the definition of the ideal client? Isn't this the sort of guy we've always wanted? This is, I can tell you, the discussion that is going on in your nation's capital now. And there's a split among the proxies, because unlike the British Empire and the French Empire, which it's replacing in the... And there's a split among the proxies, because unlike the British Empire and the French Empire, which it's replacing in the region, the American Empire 
hasn't until recently ruled by direct physical presence. It's ruled by proxy, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey. In order then, the Israelis wouldn't mind a Lebanized Iraq. They didn't mind a Lebanized Lebanon if it came to that. Um, they wouldn't mind a Lebanized Middle East. They want to take other Arab countries' nationalist challenges off the chessboard. Who wouldn't? If they want a greater Israel, they'll need to do that. Why you should pay for this is a question I don't know whether you ever ask yourself. I don't know what answer you come up with when you do. You are paying for it anyway, so you should ask. At any rate, that's going on in parallel too. They would like that. The Saudis don't want that. Saudi Arabia doesn't need a Lebanized Iraq on its border. So it's against. Big argument in Washington between the Saudi faction of the government and the Israeli faction. Very big argument. The Iranians don't exactly have a faction in Washington anymore, though they used to, um, in the person of Oliver North and so on, but they have friends. And the Iranians would like not the Lebanization of Iraq, but a Shia Muslim protectorate in the south under Iranian protection. Sponsorship. Saudis don't want that either. They're a Sunni Muslim dictatorship. They don't want a Shia Muslim hive off, and they don't want it on their border. Uh, this is my last 30 seconds, sir. The Turks would like to take a greater interest in a Kurdish protectorate in Iraq, but they want to know how to do it without giving ideas to their own Kurds. Thus, I think I, I, think I have aptly described to you the situation among your imperial proxies. Uh, while they squabble, Iraq dies, dies, and reverts to barbarism and strife and misery and disease and tries to bury its dead. And this is what it is to have an empire. Now, before we go to your questions, uh, each of our guests will have a chance to ask a question of each other, if they so choose. Uh, we'll take five minutes of an exchange on those. And then after that, we'll go to your questions. Uh, since Mr. Kondrick has started the summaries, we'll allow Mr. Hitchens to have the first question. Uh, Mr. Hitchens, do you have a question for Mr. Kondracki? If I'd known I was going to have this chance, but I won't pass it up all the same. Um, I tell you what I've always wanted to ask him, and which, <laughs> what, what is made relevant by this evening is this. Do you think, Morton, that America can be both an empire and a democratic republic? at the same time. If you think that, why do you think it would be the first country to pull off that double? And if you don't think it can, which of the two would you choose? <laughs> By any definition that the world has ever known of empire, which I include your, the, the, uh, the country which uh, Christopher's magazine has been has been uh, cheering for these, these past 70 years, the Soviet Union, the United States is not, is not, it's no, a dear, fact, dear, dear. it is a fact, is, it, the United States is not an empire. We do not, have, we do not have our troops stationed in countries where we are not welcome. We have, Love we have, answer. wait just a second, where do we have our, just a minute now, where, where do we have our troops? Just a minute. Cuba. We have our troops. We have our troops. We have our oh, troops yeah. in the Philippines. Exactly so. We have our troops in the Philippines by agreement. We have our troops in Japan by agreement. We have our troops in Korea by agreement. We have our troops in, in the, I've covered the Philippines. Let, let him we have answer, an agreement. Please. Now that the Philippines don't want us there anymore, we are going to go away. Right? <laughs> look, look, your country does not, your country does not go around the world decimating other cultures. It does not do it. it our, we have no troops in Nicaragua. Well, he's asking for an answer. Okay. All right. Now, so my point is, my point is that what we have is is a democracy. The the it, it is it is the it is the the um, the the most the the most distinguished great civilization that has ever existed on the face of the earth. It is, it provides, it provides more liberty, more opportunity, freer speech than any other country of, of, its, of its size and power that has ever existed on the face of the earth. And it presumes to, and, and the whole world would like what we have. It would like our economic wealth. It would like our freedom. And gradually but gradually, Eastern Europe, 
the Soviet Union, Latin America is all coming around in this direction because it understands that that's where opportunity lies. Now, occasionally it is necessary for us to, to defend our interests. Um, we, have, we, have, we have defended our interests a few times since the end of World War II. We have not always defended our interests in the most honorable way possible, but generally speaking, over the last 40 years, we have, we have attacked only, only in a, in a counterattack. We have, we have used... Fidel Castro has never had an election in the entire time that he has been that he's been in power, okay. and he has tortured he has tortured his own population and decimated his own population. All right, let me jump in here. So at this the point. point of the matter is the answer to your question is that that I would choose if I had to choose between them, and I do choose between them, a democracy, not an empire. The United States is not an empire by any by any accounting of the normal word empire. Now, okay. it's my turn to ask a question. Yes, Mr. Kondraki. I don't understand. I don't understand what your bottom line is here. Samir El Khalil does not want us never to have conducted this war at all. What he wanted was us for us to pursue the war. And he wants us to, this minute to pursue the war all the way to Baghdad, decimating in in the process however many people we have to kill in order to get to Baghdad and capture Baghdad. Uh, now, we, we stopped the war. George Bush, I think, uh, wrongly stopped the war at the end of February. He did not chase the Republican guards who are now killing off the Shiites and, and killing off the Kurds. We did not bomb them. We, we cut, the, we cut the, the bombing off. Now, you claim that it's in order to keep Hitler in power. I think that's ludicrous. But what I'm asking you, Christopher, is are you in favor of sending the United States Army to capture Baghdad. That seems to be what you're in favor of. And how many people will that kill? No, I'm, I'm not in favor of that. Um, well, what are you wasn't in favor of? I wasn't in favor of uh, occupation of any part of the territory of Iraq to begin with. My point about Khalil was this. He's an interesting guy. As you know, Samir Hal Khalil isn't his real name because he has to write in anonymity uh, as an Iraqi dissident. Um, he's, a, I think, becoming rather a sad figure. He's, he's a lifetime uh, Iraqi communist, as a matter of fact. I, mean, I do know who he is. I know what his real, real name is. He's a member of the higher committee of the Iraqi Communist Party, a group that suffered a great deal from Saddam Hussein. He's uh, subject to the warping of judgment that can come from a lifetime of Iraqi communism. And he staked his uh, claim on the United States fighting the war it said it was going to fight for the reasons it said it was going to fight them. And he's now in a horrifying position and is trying to make sense of it. His country has been devastated and is faced with a renewal of the worst kind of sectarian and religious conflict, if not dismemberment from outside powers. He thinks the only way to make that worthwhile is to press on with it and to have an American occupation of his capital city. I think he's lost his mind. I think that there are good reasons why the United States doesn't do that, but these are good reasons why it shouldn't have gone this far before stopping. In other words, as with the Dresden and the Hitler thing, one or the other, baby, but not both. All right. That's the exchange for this part of the program. Uh, we're going to move to the uh, question and answer section in just a moment here. You might want to line up behind the microphone. There's either one or two of them at the back of the room. I guess there's, I guess there's just one. Uh, one note about sort of protocol, since we do have a microphone, let's try and, and limit the amount of response from the floor, okay, for whoever happens to be speaking at the time. I guess uh, directed to both of you, um, I agree, Mr. Kondraki, with the idea of national interest, but I wonder what the national interest has been in this war in terms of perhaps if you would say our national interest is uh, peaceful access to oil, free access to oil, um, stable Middle East. I, I don't see where this war is anything but a blip in a long range of misapplied policies going back to 1948. Uh, I, I don't see where this war is anything but a blip in a long range of misapplied policies going back to 1948. 
by the United States. And I'm wondering how this war has helped our national interest when it has, I think, only created more of the same type of problems that the U.S. has not wanted to face for the last most of 40 years. Namely? The stability of the Middle East with the idea of not only the Palestinian homeland, but also trying to um, bring up the democracies in that country. It's ironic that most of the, the only the, the countries that we were aligned with were countries that if they were actually democratically run, they would not probably have been behind us in the war. Okay. Well, there are, there are several purposes in the, in the American national interest that we, that we went into this endeavor. Uh, the, the first one is oil. Now, everybody says, oh, oil, dirty, rotten oil, means money. Uh, the fact is that oil is the fuel of the world. Uh, like it or not, uh, the, the, Zimbabwe runs on oil, as does Detroit, right? And, and, the, and he who controls the world's oil supply has a very great deal of power in this world, as well as a, as a very great deal of money. And Saddam Hussein uh, was threatening the, the, the world's access to, to oil at a, at a reasonable price. I mean, he, he, would he have invaded Saudi Arabia uh, if he'd been allowed to? Who knows? Maybe he just would have intimidated Saudi Arabia into uh, doing whatever he wanted to, raising the price of oil at his, at his wishes, paying him tribute, uh, uh, subjecting its foreign policy to his management, uh, whatever. Uh, any of those things is plausible and, and I think, likely. Um, so our, our major national interest was uh, the security of, of the oil supply in the region. Secondly, um, there, is, there is an interest in having um, aggression be, uh, not be rewarded. Now, people say, well, we don't, when, when there's an aggression, when the Turks invaded Cyprus or when uh, uh, China, I don't ever hear anybody saying when China invaded Vietnam, you know, th as that example, somehow that gets lost. But in any event, um, when, you know, we don't, we don't respond to every aggression in every case, that's true. But in this case, there, this was an, an especially naked aggression in an, in an especially vulnerable and important place in the world. And so we, um, uh, we did this in order to prevent further trouble later. If this man was working on nuclear weapons, as clearly he was, um, his power to intimidate uh, people in, in his neighborhood would have been even greater. Now, in the aftermath of this, there, there has been a shakeup in the... In, in the equation of, of all the uh, the people in the region, the Saudis we've 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 saved the Saudis, we've saved the Kuwaitis, we've saved the security in the uh, of of the Gulf region. The Syrians, um, who are in in the case of Hafez Assad as thuggish as Saddam Hussein ever was, is temporarily on our side, uh, and we've got a chance. Now wait just a second. I'm not I'm not pretending that that Hafez Assad is a good guy. I'm saying that there, is, that there is a possibility to get a kind of diplomacy going here that we haven't been able to in the past. People do get shook up as a result of wars. The Saudis are willing, they say they're willing at least, to talk uh, about talking to Israel for the first time in history. Um, the PLO uh, is, uh, is um, uh, discredited for having sided with Saddam Hussein. Nobody, nobody likes the PLO. If we can get the Israelis to make a few gestures toward the Palestinians, we might get something started on the Arab-Israeli front. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, we can get to some more of it later. Yeah, well, the reason why national interest is considered a politically correct thing for you to believe in by the government is that anything can be done in its name. Um, and after all, it was in your national interest to reflag Kuwait's oil tankers as a means of helping uh, Iraq win a uh, war against Iran, which it had started by an act of aggression, and the same arguments used by Mort would perfectly fit without an adjustment uh, as a matter of real politic. Uh, that policy too, and for all I know, did. Um, I must say for him, though, that he's one of the uh, few conservatives who was appalled by Saddam Hussein, Hussein's regime uh, before uh, August of last year. But I think that if it had been put to him that, look, it's better than Iranian fundamentalism, uh, it's a stabilizing force, because look at the map, Iraq's right in the middle, it has common borders, contrary to Charlton Heston, 
with the following, all of them very suggestive countries if you count, you know, from Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria, uh, and so on, and Turkey, of course, uh, and Iran, right in the middle of the map is just where you don't want a vacuum because you know what will happen. Uh, it might draw... This is, these are the real politic reasons why the administration used to leave Saddam alone, and we're now seeing how persuasive in real politic terms, at least, those were. So I think we can simply say about national interest that it will suit any such interpretation, however cynical. What it will not do is the moral and ethical job that Morton, to his credit, wishes it would do. It won't help you in deciding about the matter of when an aggression is an aggression, I'm sorry to say. Realpolitik has another definition. Actually, there's a lot of needless confusion among leftists and liberals about this. Sometimes they say, oh, well, we didn't bleat about this or that invasion, or, or our authorities didn't, or aggression. So that's a double standard. I think that's not true. If you look at the other regional aggressions that have occurred, the Israeli uh, occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, the uh, Sharon invasion of Lebanon, the Syrian occupation of Lebanon, the Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara, the um, Turkish invasion of Cyprus, you will not find that the United States didn't oppose them. You'll find it supported them. Um, that's not a double standard, that's a single standard. Excuse me. In other words, when is it an aggression, when is it not an aggression? When we decide. I repeat, this is to define imperialism. It's that simple. And oh, come now. Look, the United States... And only, when, and only when you get that simple point can you get the complicated ones. We, which we, begin we there. Did, Look, uh, we did not support uh, the, the, uh, the Israeli occupation of, of, of the West Bank. We do not support it. Just a minute. Oh, come now. Seriously now. Seriously. At the, how did... The, how, I'm sure that I'm, I'm stealing somebody else's time, but we'll get to it later. It'll, somebody, somebody else will ask it. Go ahead. Next question. Uh, uh, I agree that it was an imperialist war in the Persian Gulf and it was not justified. My question to you is where do you think the next justified war will take place? And if I could go right into my next question so you can think about them together. Um, for Mr. Kondrecki, um, I, I was curious by your use of the butcher justification in your argument, although I can, from your remarks already, I can kind of see where you're coming from now. because. Um, I think that the butcher analogy requires a complete lack of knowledge and understanding about U.S. history from the takeover of the continent until more recently Grenada and Panama, not to mention the rest of Central and South America. And that it, actually a brief survey of history will show that the United States has been behind almost every single right-wing butchering dictatorship on the face of the planet. And so I find it astounding, actually, that you use the butcher analogy to condemn Saddam Hussein when in fact I think that using this will show that my question is how can you use a butcher justification to, to say Saddam Hussein is bad on the one hand while at the same time completely ignoring the butchering of the United States? Well, with respect, I think you thought of that question before I'd said what I just said because I think that was a double standards question. And um, so I would rather take your question as a statement if you don't think that's uh, unfair or and, uh, certainly I hope you don't think it uh, condescending the um, case of the next war will be determined in that manner I think the next war will probably be one to redress the balance um, against Iranian uh, fundamentalism and irredentism in the region and I think that was why even before this war began there were voices raised in the defense department saying let's not smash Iraq up too badly, we might need it again someday. Another definition, by the way, of colonial thinking, uh, now being felt extremely painfully by those Iraqis who were naive enough to believe with their mass of public opinion and lumpen academic and lumpen media America counterparts that this war was being fought in the name of democracy and being fought to end wars rather than begin them. Um, there are such things as justified wars including involving crossing the territory of another country. I think myself that the Vietnamese intervention in Cambodia and Kampuchea can be justified. I think the Tanzanian uh, crossing of, the, of another country. I think myself that the Vietnamese intervention in Cambodia and Kampuchea can be justified. I think the Tanzanian uh, crossing of the border of Uganda 
uh, which led, in the, led to, the, to the collapse of the Amin regime can be justified also, but these are careful and localized, and to borrow from St. Augustine, who I must, think, must say I think is the father of tautology in these matters, um, they were at least proportionate. I can't let, whether or not anyone else is going to ask about it, it just isn't true that the United States did not uh, support the 1967 uh, occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, nor is it true to say that it doesn't continue to support it in the sense that it pays for it and that it votes to uphold it at the United Nations, votes to protect the occupier and supplies the occupier with the necessary armaments with which to do it. That meets most of the tests for an underwriter, in my opinion. And it also raises an interesting question. Who does Morton mean by nobody? I know who he means when he means nobody. He means nobody he thinks counts in the world of, say, the Council on Foreign Relations, the places where they sing in the uh, councils of um, NATO and Washington and so forth. It's certainly true in those places nobody, as you put it, I wrote it down, nobody likes the PLO. But I know at least one place where they like the PLO, and that's where the Palestinians live, and that remains true. And it remains true, it remains, remains true both as a moral point and as a political point. The PLO was long ago chosen by the Palestinian people as their representative in the struggle for national self-determination, like it or not. A failure to recognize that is certainly a moral failure, but it's also a crashing political one. Um, well, let, let, let's deal with the Palestinian point. Um, the United States... Oh, the butchery. All right, all right, the butchery. Um, do, I, do I have to go through the whole litany of Saddam Hussein? And, and uh, I, I think you'll all agree that, that Saddam Hussein is a butcher. Yeah, all right. Uh, I, do not, I do not find... I, don't, I, I mean, I don't know what you're talking about. Where are we... We are not... Look, wounded knee. Uh, oh, come on. All right, all right, calm down. Look. Oh, hey, look, look, it's a question of whether the policy of the United States government in any, in any time over which we have any control, right, is engaged in, in, in the kind of butchery that, that you see people like Saddam Hussein engaged in. Now, did we, did we kill a lot of people? In, in Vietnam, thank you. In Vietnam, we killed a lot of people. Uh, we killed a lot of people in Vietnam. We did kill a lot of people in Vietnam. The people of, the people of Vietnam, the, the, in, in the case of Korea, there was an invasion of the North, I mean, uh, of the South by the North. Uh, we were responding to that invasion. It was a defensive war, and it, it, was, it was not an aggressive war. In the case of Vietnam, it was a misguided attempt uh, to to uh, forestall communism from taking over uh, a region, uh, we did we we confused it. It was not a war of imperialism. It was a stupid war. We should never been, have been in it. Uh, but it was not a war undertaken to um, to extend the boundaries of the United States or or uh, uh, extend control over over a part of the world. It was it was a defensive war as we understood it at the time. Furthermore. When the refugees, and I, I, I wish you would examine the way refugees run. For some reason, they always run in our direction. Uh, from, from North Vietnam, they ran to South Vietnam. Very few went in the other direction. Uh, when we lost out in, Viet, in, in Vietnam, uh, the refugees all got on boats and risked um, uh, pirates and uh, sharks and, and everything else in order to get the hell out of that wonderful country that we lost to. My guess is that if, a, that if a vote had been taken or ever allowed in Vietnam after the wonderful communist victory, that if, uh, if people could have asked whether they would have just as soon had a Nguyen uh, Van Thieu there or not, they probably would have voted for Nguyen Van Thieu after they saw what the communists did. It is a wreckage of a country, right? It is run as a prison camp. We do not run prison camps. We do not run prison camps. We do not run prison camps, and we and we have we have. I'm not saying that America. Now, just a second, just a minute now. If I could just insert here, because you're not being heard. 
if if we're going to have the guests speak, I think most people here would like to hear them, and it's hard to hear them over all the cat class. Save it for save it for Jean Kirkpatrick. All right, next. I'd like to say this in the context of what seems to be a growing hardline response to the Palestinian problem in Israel, and I'd like to suggest that your concept of a just war is going to make impossible a just peace. You know, nations obviously do not learn by example or by history or from history. Maybe they can learn by example, and the example we've set right now is you draw a line in the sand and you destroy everything on the other side. How can we hope for a negotiated settlement when we have put such validity on the use of force? Um, the only the the I'm not saying that that there that there is necessarily going to be a successful peaceful conclusion to the Arab-Israeli problem. It is it is a horrifically difficult problem. What there is here is is an opportunity created by the fact that at least as of last week, American prestige in the region was very high. We have influence that we didn't used to have because we've gone, we've proved that we're willing to use force in the in order to defend these various countries. A matter which we which was in deep doubt uh, before uh, August 2nd. So we have some ability to to persuade countries like Saudi Arabia, which have a lot of money, uh, to help us out in in trying to put over a a Middle East peace settlement. Now the way it could work is. It, it could work by the by the Saudis saying to the Syrians, no more money unless you're willing to enter into good faith negotiations with the Israelis. Uh, uh, and we have to, we've got to say to the Israelis, um, for the moment, for the moment, not forever, for the moment, the heat is off on the Palestinian issue as to a long-term settlement, but you get into business with, with uh, the Syrians on the Golan Heights and see if you can't work out a deal. Meanwhile, what we should be doing, and I think we have some possibility of doing it, by, by the fact that we have defended the Israelis uh, along with everybody else with Patriot missiles, and we are rely a reliable partner, is that we can say to the Israelis, okay, the, the Palestinians are difficult. They, sh they cheered the scuds as they, were flying, as they were flying over. The Palestinians hate your guts, but, if you do, but, but go back to at least Camp David and offer elections offer uh, a humane governance of the region, uh, offer, an offer negotiations with whoever the, the, uh, the Palestinians elect in the, in the next round and, and, conduct a, and then agree to talk to them about the, the final settlement somewhere off in the distance as you agreed in the case of Camp David. Now those things are possible to do. Those are the currently going um, uh, measures being contemplated by the Bush administration and this is not this is not an imperialistic endeavor you know this is this is if you could work it out an activity um, uh, that uh, th that deserves a Nobel Peace Prize I mean to to get something done here after all these years of fighting and hatred and killing uh, would be a would be a considerable accomplishment and, th and that's the, the that's the channel that that it could happen by and I don't see any other channel if we don't do it nothing's going to happen and, and you know when Christopher was talking about well the next war is going to be the war to contain Iran after after Iraq the question is what happens to that region if the United States is not around to do to do anything where the Iraqis the Iraqis go after the Iranians the Iranians go after the Saudis and and everybody is blowing up everybody else's oil fields um, it could be worse. It could be worse. Yeah, I'd like to uh, say a couple of things. Um, the first of which I regret. Um, it, it seems to me unpardonable that uh, Morton should get rhino pen noises when he's making his case, because it also seems to me, as I judge the sense of the meeting, he's probably in the minority, in your opinion. That is all the more reason uh, not to make those noises. If you knew how you sounded when you make them, you wouldn't do it. The grammar of the last question, or the, uh, the implication, was that the grammar of the last question, or the, uh, the implication, was a, I thought, a, somewhat a pacifist one. And I've said before that 
I think there are immoral considerations in, involved in pacifism, and I'm not myself a pacifist. However, I've never been able to understand how people like Morton believe, and I know that they do, that there is a widespread fear out in the Middle East that the United States is reluctant to use force. I don't know where this rumor started, and I don't know what keeps it going, and I don't know why there's this periodic neurotic requirement to prove, oh yeah, we can. Do you remember the TWA hijack that was taken from Beirut and over to Algiers and here and there and ended up, fortunately, with I mean, no serious loss of life? In fact, I think none in the end. They let the women off in Algiers. The American women passengers were let off and interviewed. And one of them said, when asked, what are they like, your captors? She said, well, I don't understand it. She's a good-hearted woman. She said, I don't get it. They seem to have this terrific grudge against New Jersey. And I thought for a bit, and I thought, is it Frank Sinatra's cassettes in, you know, Hamra Street or something? So, of course, of course, of course, the USS New Jersey, a ship several times the size of this building, can and did fire shells the size of Volkswagens, the weight, actually, of Volkswagens. I've seen the shells, into the villages around Beirut in an attempt to suppress the Druze, rebellion and confirm in power a Maronite government of the extreme Christian right. The lady on the plane had forgotten it. I think most people had. People who lived in Beirut had not. There is no huddle of persons in the Middle East getting together thinking, boy, I wonder if the US is going soft. <laughs> not after General Sharon there isn't. Not after the bombing of Libya there isn't. Not after the USS New Jersey there isn't. Not after the uh, paying and patronizing of the occupation continuing of the West Bank and Gaza, there isn't. So I think you can put that worry at least out of your minds. I don't usually argue people should worry less, but on this point, they can. Now, I strove in what I said earlier to break the link, the logical or moral link, between saying Saddam Hussein is a butcher and saying that this is a just war. I'm depressed to find that I didn't carry Mr. Kondraki Morton with me. You can believe either or neither or both of these things. If you want to prove a connection, you must at least dispute what I say, which is that the critique of those of us opposed not just to the war but the policy that led to it and underpins it still, was precisely that that policy had room for Saddam Hussein at the height of his butcherdom as a potential proxy until 2nd of August last. He was a pet of the State and Defense and Agriculture Departments till the 2nd of August last, and he may be about to be, in some form or another, a pet again. Thus, it has to be shown by the proposers of this motion, or its sympathizers, that between the statement, S. Hussein, Esquire, is a butcher, and this is a just war, the second statement, there is a logical or moral or geopolitical connection. And I, I submit there is none. The two propositions, as put together, as justification, render each other void. Obviously, it's true, and it's becoming clearer every day, that the Saudi Arabian patrons of this policy and paymasters of it would agree to a Sunni Muslim dictatorship in Baghdad, five times as brutal as Hussein's, <clears throat> on condition that it was one and a half times as pliable to Saudi and American interests. Isn't that clear to anyone who, who takes an interest in the matter? <laughs> Obviously it is. Is that a cause good enough to kill upwards of 150,000 Iraqis if you add them all together and leave out the famine and pestilence? I would say not. I rest my case there. Well, you, you eliminate one point about what happened on August 2nd. Now, what happened on August 2nd was that, that, the, uh, th that this butcher invaded another country uh, again for a second time and demonstrated that he was willing to carry out his butchery across international borders. Now, we do not go around. The, the international system is not sufficiently mature that we go around uh, preventing uh, going going into countries to prevent dictators from uh, from from butchering their own people. Sometimes we do, uh, but but often we don't, and and the rules don't allow that to happen. Now he was going to spread that system around to to other places in the region, and that's and that's why we did what we did. I'm not saying that we did it in the first instance to to block him from. Um, from engaging in butchery within his borders. Clearly, we did not. We, we you know, much to our, our, uh, our disgrace, we had all too little to say about it before, uh, before August 2nd. But that's the connection. He was going to spread it around and do it to other people. Well, 
It'll come up again, so I'll reserve my... Uh, I'll say this to both of you, but I'm particularly interested in Mr. Kondracki's answer. Um, given what you said earlier about the uh, Christian idea of a just war, um, I'd like your thoughts on the presidential proclamation earlier this week in which Bush thanked God for our victory in Iraq and thanked God for sparing so many American lives without mentioning um, the Iraqi deaths. And I wonder if you think that that is an attitude that um, Christians should take towards this war. And I'm asking you because you did um, express an opinion about Christian pacifism, so I assume you have an opinion on this. I think that, uh, that any, any moral evaluation of this war should say that we killed too many people. Uh, we killed too many Iraqi soldiers. We killed too many of the wrong Iraqi soldiers. We could, should have killed more um, Republican guards. And which, which is the, which, now wait a minute, which is the consequence, if we were going to save, if we were going to save the Shiites and the Kurds, instead of bombing all these, these, uh, uh, scudsy draftees, down, I take that back, instead of, instead of killing all these, uh, innocent draftees down in, uh, down in Kuwait, what we should have done is to have killed more of uh, Saddam Hussein's hired killers, the ones who are shooting little children uh, in, in the forehead uh, in Basra and, uh, and elsewhere and in, and in Kirkuk. Um, the, those guys are Saddam Hussein's henchmen. Now, um, if I were Bush, I would have said, I would have said, and I would have meant, because he, if he'd said it, he probably wouldn't have meant it, um, that, uh, that we mourn the loss of, of Iraqi lives. And, and I do. Um, but upon whom is the responsibility? You know, I think it's partly on us. It certainly is. But we didn't start this war. Well, I've never been able to summon enough Christian humility to believe that there's a supreme being who made me and watches over me with particular care. So I'm disqualified uh, from the first half of the question. Uh, I attribute my presence here to the laws of <clears throat> biology, and I think it would be very unfair on uh, any known god to um, attribute my presence here to anything else. <laughs> so I have no invisible means of supporting this argument, but I can tell you why they massacred the uh, draftees and not the Republican Guard. It's for the reason I gave you. What would you do if you wanted to punish the Iraqi people but preserve a semblance of the Iraqi regime? You do what they did do. It has come up again and again uh, by Christopher that we, that we are in some sort of secret conspiracy with Saddam Hussein. Open uh, conspiracy. Oh, open. All right. Uh, I, think that, I, think that frankly, I think that, frankly, is laughable. I mean, how many times has, has Bush um, said that we'd love it if somebody popped Saddam Hussein? I mean, he said it over and over and over again, and it is his policy. What the administration, I think wrongly, right, I, but what the administration hopes will happen here is that once there is not a, uh, a set of rebellions going on on the fringes of the country which, which threaten the cohesion of the whole, that the, the, ru the ruling class in Baghdad will say, this guy, Saddam Hussein, has killed um, uh, 500,000 in, uh, in the Iran-Iraq war, uh, however many uh, tens of thousands more in, in, the, uh, in the Gulf War, and what have we got to show for it? Out you go, Saddam Hussein, preferably feet first, uh, and that there would be a new regime. Now, um, yes, there there is, the, this, the, this, this administration is not going to have truck with an Iraq controlled by Saddam Hussein. I guarantee you that, that, that UN sanctions will continue to apply as long as Saddam Hussein is in power. All right, next question. I have a question for each participant. First to Mr. Hitchens. Um, the anti-war movement took several slogans during, during the uh, war. Uh, we support the troops, not the war. Support the troops, bring them home alive. Peace is patriotic. The movement also used flags, yellow ribbons in their demonstrations. And finally, they always used body bags uh, showing that this is what's going to be filled with American soldiers coming home. Why was this a good idea or a bad idea? And my second question to Mr. Conracki, uh, since you put so much credence in the UN as a neutral body of world peacemaker, world peacemaker, especially those pertaining to Israel and the United States and its invasion of Panama, its interference with Nicaragua, or is that only for 
countries other than the United States and Israel to adhere to? Um, one of the, you want me, uh, let me go yes. first. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I, I remember it better. No, you go first. Go. <laughs> Yeah, I've been I've been very critical. I was at the time, and I remain, of the anti-war movement for its underdevelopment on this point. I think that um, perhaps wittingly, perhaps semi-consciously, um, everybody, uh, and I think one can't exempt even oneself, fell for some part of the administration's fantastic threat inflation campaign. This was the the more odd when you remember that many of us in Washington had got used to exposing giant and pathetic. Uh, and grandiose and hysterical claims about how Nicaragua was going to take over Mexico and Texas and so on and so forth. Down the years, and all the Soviet Union had this protocol design for world domination. One had got used to that. Oddly enough, the, some of the smarter people who were most used to dealing with threat inflation, and I think there may be a cultural problem here simply to do but with knowledge of and understanding of the Middle East, bought the absurd line that the administration didn't itself believe of, of the confrontation with a, a desert superpower. I mean, only Bush and Saddam believed that he was a new Saladin and the deliverer of um, Iraq by apocalyptic weaponry and so forth. And, and the result of that was, well, there was the one that I think I don't need to elaborate, which was a, a tremendous wrong footing. And in effect, a peace movement unable to protest at an air war that was waged for the humanitarian purpose of, minim of minimizing casualties. And this is something we'll all have to wrestle with morally and politically for some time to come. I think, I think the wrestling can and uh, could and should have come um, earlier. Um, the answer to your question is no. Uh, and I'll, and I'll, am, I, am I willing to have the United States observe uh, every United Nations resolution uh, regardless of what it says? Absolutely not. I mean, do, do I believe that Zionism is racism? I do not. That's a UN resolution, and I, and I reject it flatly. Um, the what, you know, what has come up here again and again uh, is, that, is, the, is the question of national interest. All around the world, you see countries with national interests. And certain of them uh, uh, pursue their national interests by force of arms, by subversion, by terrorism, by uh, uh, whatever kind of violence you can imagine. Um, some of them are, have national, you know, the Turks, want, the Turks want pieces of this country. They want Cyprus. They want, uh, they want a, uh, a, a client regime if they can have one in, uh, in Iraq and so on and so forth. Uh, it's, it, it's a nasty world out there, as they used to say in, uh, in Hill Street Blues. Um, and the, and the, ideal, the ideal, which we will all uh, reach someday, if we don't blow ourselves up first, and I think we won't, is a world of law, is a world in a world where where, where people get together and and decide uh, uh, what's good in the common interest and uh, and uh, and pursue it. Now we're we're slowly inching in that in that direction. We have we have crept up out of the the, the ooze and we're and we're heading off on, onto the land. Um, now, if you want if you want a, a civilization, if you have in mind a civilization which can lead the world in this regard, w w the place you look is to Europe and the United States and increasingly Latin America and those countries which are used to, uh, are used to the, r the rule of law. Now, the, the, the United Nations General Assembly, uh, up until very recently, has been composed of countries which themselves do not know the rule of law. Um, they're getting there, right? Africa is beginning to realize that, that state socialism and, and dictatorial rule was not such a, a good way to, to operate. Botswana is a democracy, and by God, Botswana is a little bit more prosperous than, than some of the other countries in the region. They're, they're learning that there is a connection between the rule of law and prosperity. The Soviet Union is learning that um, in, a, in a very difficult way. So the point is, the point here is that when the United Nations is ruled um, by a, a collection of blocks, each of them pursuing the national interest of its, of its biggest member, its most powerful member, I do not accept that, that, the, that, the, that the outcome of the United Nations is always in the interest of the people of the world. So therefore, 
the United, and the United States is going to retain its ability to decide which United Nations resolutions to, to, uh, to honor and which it, it doesn't choose to honor. I think that as the world gets more democratic and gets more accustomed to the rule of law, that, um, that we'll be honoring more and more. And in this case, look at what happened. I mean, it, it was damn near unanimous in the Security Council uh, what we were up to. There was no veto applied. I mean, I think that we, that we, that we were on the side of the rule of law in this case. Uh, and I don't, but I don't think that the UN is always on the side of the rule of law. We have time for two more questions. Let's take the next one now. Okay. Um, I'd like to preface my remarks with a comment on uh, the Thomistic idea of a just war. Um, I grew up Catholic and went through Catholic schools for 16 years. And some of you may find it humorous to know that the most um, durable argument that Thomas Aquinas posed, other than a just war one, in terms of its effect on theologians and the fathers of the church and philosophers, was how many angels could stand on the head of a pin. This was debated almost as long as his just war theory. Kind of sheds a light on the validity of his theories, I think. Um, Mr. Kondracki, I'm kind of perplexed by your reading from, I couldn't see the title, but the red book that you held up saying that, that several thousand people have died under torture in Iraq in the last two decades. Um, during at least some part of those two decades, Iraq was considered a United States ally, yet you say that you were opposed to the military power of Iraq. I would like to know what your opinion of that military power was at the time when Iraq was considered a United States ally. I would also like to ask you, how you define colonialism, if it requires a military presence, a diplomatic attache, and a U.S. flag flying, or if not, in fact, the presence of a multinational corporation, which is basically how the world in the 20th century runs, constitutes colonialism. And the principle of that is go into a country which is in need, give them a little bit of what they need, and take from them everything that we possibly need. In 1965, Indonesia was considered a defense, an ally in defense of the United States in the, in the Pacific Rim. Yet President Sukarno killed over a half a million people attempting to hold on to his regime before it finally fell. We never heard anything about that. In Nigeria, when the Igbos seceded from the Nigerian Federation, over two, almost two million people were killed in a war. Unfortunately, the Igbos happened to have the land which had the oil fields, which they unfortunately nationalized, which upset British Petroleum, Royal Dutch Shell, and Texaco, and thus caused the United States Great Britain and France to supply the arms to the Nigerians that enabled that war to go on for so long. When the tanks rolled in Tiananmen Square, we didn't say too much about it afterwards in this country. And the reason I suggest is because of the list of multinational corporations waiting to get on the docket to get into China to make their fortunes. Four weeks ago, I sat in the small theater in this building, four weeks ago, mind you, so the war was still going on, right? And I listened to some students behind me from Ohio describe their father's fortunate situation as a corporate developer who had been offered already $390,000 to go to Kuwait and consult. Not build, but consult, which means he could just be there for a couple days, fly home, run his corporation in Ohio, make a lot more money there, and fly back and forth between Kuwait and Iraq. That, I think, is colonialism. I would like to know your definition of colonialism. Mr. Hitchens, I wonder if you would comment on what it means in the United States to have a cellophane-wrapped war in which General Schwarzkopf says he won't talk about the number of casualties because he's not going to fall into the trap that we fell into in Vietnam, during Vietnam, of having too much public sentiment run against the war when we find out just what it really cost in terms of human lives. Saddam Hussein was not an ally of the United States in the sense that Britain is an ally or Germany is an ally or Japan is an ally or South Korea as an ally, etc. I mean, it, it, was, it was at a certain point in history when there was a greater threat in the region, namely Iran, a um, uh, collaborator, uh, or it, it, but, but the word ally implies friend, right? They, we, what we did was we tilted in the direction of Iraq. We in this in this special situation. Uh, now, what did I think during that time? You know, there are there are loads of people. We uh, in this in this special situation. Uh, now, what did I think during that time? You know, there are there are loads of people walking around Washington saying Iraq is could be the pillar of our uh, regional 
uh, of regional stability for us in the, you know, in the area. We should be allies with Iraq, which we, which we never were. Um, I looked at Iraq and I saw Saddam Hussein and what he was doing and what he had done. And I was perfectly appalled. I mean, how are you going to, how are you going to put up with that? Uh, so, I mean, that, that was my, that was my position on that. I was aghast at the idea that we would have, uh, have Saddam Hussein as an ally. Um, now, on the, on the question of, uh, multi, on, on the question of colonialism, um, how did, how were the great empires, colonial empires of the world established? I submit to you that they were not established by uh, tradesmen uh, going in and uh, and saying, "Would you like to buy some of my silk?" You know, they were fundamentally they were they were established with gunboats and with armies, uh, and this is not the way multinational corporations fundamentally the way multinational corporations uh, establish themselves. There, this world will be a richer world when we are engaged in free trade as much as we can across international borders. When when restrictions do not apply on the ability of somebody to invest in a foreign country and for the right concomitant with that of the people in that place to organize labor unions and, and negotiate um, and negotiate contracts. The fact of the matter is that capitalism makes countries richer. Capitalism makes countries richer. I give you the example before you all laugh and guffaw. In, uh, um, I give you the example of South Korea. I give you another example of Taiwan. I give you another example of Thailand. All countries which 30 years ago were desperately poor, where in the case of South Korea, uh, people were starving to death in 1956, and the, 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 the dirty old capitalists and the dirty old um, uh, multinationals uh, and the savings and energy and investment of the people of the region and the hard work of the people of the region have have led those countries into second world status. Now show me, show me a place where the capitalist system does not prevail, where you can have that kind of an advancement in the standard of living of the people who live there. Nowhere in Africa, God knows nowhere in Eastern Europe, God knows not in the Soviet Union, not in China, all those places where the wonderful socialist system where, where by God we were going to have equal conditions for absolutely everybody at the point of a gun, not one of those places has ever produced a higher standard of living across the board for the people who live there than has happened in, in, in small uh, Asian capitalist country after small Asian capitalist country. They are not perfect, right? They just had another military coup in Thailand. South Korea is not a democracy, but it's heading in that direction. Taiwan is a hell of a lot more democratic than China is. Uh, now, if you believe in human rights, if you believe in human rights, and you believe in the advancement, the physical and moral advancement of the people who live in these various countries, you're far more likely to have it with a democratic capitalist system than you are with socialism at the point of a gun. Well, I think I was asked to comment only on the, um, the matter of the, the war without conscience. And I think I've said all I want to say uh, about that. <laughs> oh, but well, never mind. I had a codicil on the political economy of growth, but it, I guess it can wait. <laughs> yeah, let's hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> but for some reason, um, we don't find the Kondrekis of the world criticizing the U.S. involvement in that torture and murder. But we've had the this CIA was involved very directly. With respect, we've had this question. Um, and I, I wonder why you don't talk about El Salvador. And then I wonder when, I'm leading up to, to Mr. Kondrekis talk about democracy, which is really my question. And that is, you call it a democracy, but you get a bunch of Native Americans put together a movement to try and get something decent for themselves, and the FBI slaughters them, kills them, and murders them, gets them locked up. You get um, young black people who are militantly against the genocide performed against the African American people, and the FBI, with its Quantel Pro, 
breaks them up, kills them in their beds, uh, falsifies evidence, and puts them in prison. Now, this has been going on for a long time. It started that most noticeable for us with the Palmer raids. And my question, I guess, to you is, why the double standard from people like Kondrecki? Why can't they look at what is paid for with their money and deal with it? Because if you have dissidents and you kill it, you don't have democracy. You have fascism by Quanto Pro. And you, sir, are amongst those who glorify it. So I can only look at you as a fascist mouthpiece. Oh, give me a break. Now look, uh, when Fred Hampton got killed in Chicago, it, it, I mean, that's the case I know best uh, uh, of, all, of all those cases because I, I covered it. Um, it, it, was, it was a disgrace, and every uh, fair-minded person, you know, not in the, daily, the old daily re regime, understood that it, that it was a case of murder and uh, that it was deplorable. Um, now, because such things happen in the United States of America, does that mean that we live in a fascist country? I mean, does the word fascist have any meaning to you? I mean, you, you are standing here in a room, in a room uh, on a college campus and, and, and saying what you damn well please. Nobody's going to hustle you out the door and shoot you in the alley. There are countries all over this world where, where you, would be, you wouldn't last 10 minutes out the door and Saddam Hussein ran one of those regimes. Now, are some of those regimes, uh, are, do, has the United States in the past supported regimes like that? You bet your dollar it has. I mean, Iran, Iran under the Shah was such a case. There, in, the problem of El Salvador, which has come up time and time again, on, is, is such a case under certain, uh, it is such a case, but it is a very difficult situation because the opposition in El Salvador is just as brutal as the government of El Salvador. And this fact is, it is, I'm sorry, it is. The, it is. The, and, the, and the elected government, the elected government that now exists in El Salvador is the best of, that the Arena Party can produce. And it was elected. It was elected. And, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's, what I'm saying is, is that your country does not go out looking for Democrats to kill. Your country does not, does not kill Democrats at home because they're Democrats. People do get killed. Injustices happen. The United States foreign policy is not always right. It is sometimes disastrously wrong. But it, we do live in a world in which the question compared to what still applies. And compared to, to the despots of this world, you live in the best country there is on the face of the earth. Uh, Mr. Hitchens? Well, I, I like to think I always... Um choose my words with care, but I'll choose them with extra care on this occasion because I do not want this evening to end on a note of consensus, however tentative, with Morton Kondraki. Um, for, for that reason, I, I slightly resent your last question, sir, in two respects. One, um, I think you'll agree on reflection that the greater part of it had in fact been asked before and more than once. Second, I think that if fascism did come to America, you would have to think of a new word to call it, uh, in that you might find you'd exploded the main word prematurely. And this is a quarrel I've had with uh, other people on the left in the past. What would you say if it really happened, if you think it's happened now? And uh, that's a test of seriousness, because anyone who ever has had to deal with a fascist regime, even glancingly, uh, will know how to name its parts and recognize its... Uh, fangs and teeth. Now, on this question of the benevolent, neutral, sometimes admittedly wayward, sometimes opportunist, but generally benign superpower, which is Morton's world picture of the United States, I don't think I caricature his position very much. Yes, it's wrong. Yes, it has flaws. Yes, we have a long way to go. Generally speaking, though, it is not self-interest or rapacity that drives it. Uh, generally speaking, it is on the side of the, of the United States. I don't think I caricature his position very much. Yes, it's wrong. Yes, it has flaws. Yes, we have a long way to go. Generally speaking, though, it is not self-interest or rapacity that drives it. Uh, generally speaking, it is on the side of the, 
angels and so forth. And this, this makes it easier for one to acknowledge the flaws as a, as a Christian must. Robbed as he now is of the accusation that his enemies are godless. Um, well, I disagree with this, um, but not perhaps in the way that some of you did, or not to judge by, by the barracking. Obviously, it is true that capitalism makes countries wealthier. At least, uh, let me say, nobody who doesn't think that's true has read beyond chapter one of volume one of Das Kapital. And there are three volumes, all of them tending to the view that capitalism is the greatest engine of production, innovation, and prosperity yet devised by humanity. It also argues, I think, quite persuasively in places that it is not the last word and that while it does make some countries richer, there are interesting questions as to how it does so, as to, which, as to which countries it makes poorer, and as to which people it makes rich in the countries it does enrich. And these, um, these if I may coin a phrase, these contradictions are still with us. Uh, and they are often to do with empire. For example, would you like to imagine the, the periphery of Thailand, uh, Hong Kong, and uh, Taiwan, the three tigers of capitalism as they're known in in Asia and their patron in the United States. We'd like to imagine them or their economy if there was no such thing as a war economy in the United States. Take away the war economy from California, for example. How does the equation look? Is capitalism still driven by rational accumulation in this respect? Is the manufacture of weapons the safest or the wisest way in which to close the famous uh, gap between production and consumption um, and to end the cycle of um, falling rate of profit and overproduction? Probably not. It's a very good way, but it has destabilization that comes with it. Take another case. Take the Africa you mentioned. Why is it that the most rapacious, the most wasteful, the most environmentally destructive, and the most exploitative, and the most dictatorial country in Africa, in black Africa, to stay with your analogy, is almost certainly Mobutu's Zaire, which is the closest friend of the American multinational corporation. Why is it that the Tiananmen Square faction in the Chinese party is the same faction of the party that is the keenest on the enterprise zone and the penetration of China by denominated foreign capital and for that reason enjoys the political protection from Washington? Is that a contradiction for your view? It certainly isn't for mine. I hope it isn't a harmonious view uh, in your own uh, Weltanschauung. I think not upon examination. In other words, there's a great deal still to do. There'll be even more to do. We will find history has not come to an end when countries like South Korea and Brazil actually achieve capitalism. In, the, in other words, in, when it gets to the point where the workers will be able to afford or at least afford to demand the right to purchase what they make. That point hasn't been reached yet. They haven't yet reached the 19th century capitalist uh, model. But all the models of 19th century capitalism are about to replicate and we will uh, fool ourselves if we start thinking of a world without ideology run by benevolent superpowers indifferent to history and apparently controlled by no particular interest except divine providence. Sava. Uh, the question is, who will get the last word? Does either of you uh, uh, want to uh, you get the last one. go okay. first or last? Well, I get the first, so... Um, All right. Mr. Conrad. No, so he gets uh, the last. So, no, no. <laughs> if you want to, I get, it's yours. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go now, and then you can get have the last word. Okay. Um, the, the, the question is to, to I mean... I, I take it that we've talked about the just war. I, I, can't, I can't think about uh, what else there is to say about the just war. Either, either you think it was or you think it wasn't uh, uh, by this time. Uh, I question Christopher's casualty estimates. I, don't, I, 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 think, I thought I had read absolutely everything uh, in, the, um, in most of the press about the war, and I've never seen the casualty figures that he cited. Now, I would be glad to take the citations and run along home with them and, and look them up. But, uh, but if, if Schwarzkopf had said that 100,000 uh, enemy troops had been killed, um, I would have thought that it would have been on the front page of absolutely every paper and on the... Here we go. Uh, whenever I say that, I'm, I'm usually wrong. Um, he's got the site but not the article. In any event, in any event if, uh, if, if that's the case, um, 
uh, 100,000 is, is, a, is a lot of people. Um, and uh, would, I, would I say that, uh, that this was not a just war? I would say that it would, it would strain my, my concept of justice for, for us to have killed 100,000 people um, and tens of thousands of civilians. I think that, that we, we do reach the limit with those kinds. Of, and I, then you ask, well, how many is, what's your, what's your number? Uh, my, I have no number, right? Uh, we went into this war. We did not go into this war intending to kill 100,000 people. We, we went into this war intending to get Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait and, and, uh, and to, to do so with the minimum amount of Allied casualties. Um, and and we, we bombed a great deal because we thought we had to. We did not do this out of some sort of bloodlust. Um, we, did, we did it to reduce the, um, the, uh, the amount of resistance that we'd, we would face if we had to, uh, had to go into the country. And we hoped that the, that the military, the, the Iraqi military, would cut and run uh, under the bombing and, that, and the, that there wouldn't have to be a ground invasion at all. That's the reason that, that it happened. Um, the, final, the final thing I would just leave you with is, this, is on this question of to w in what direction is the destiny of the world and, and are, we going to, are we part of the answer or part of the, the evil, as I think uh, Christopher and some, some of you other people believe, uh, a contributor to the evil in the problem. My, my notion is, as I said, a world of law. My notion is a, a world of democratic capitalism where, where workers have a right to organize, and increasingly they do. Uh, a, a place where people get to elect their own leaders. Uh, a, uh, a, a world where when they have an election, the election means something. Where they have a system of justice, uh, an independent judiciary, uh, and where the military does not, does not run the country and the, the civilians rule instead. Now, um, I would like to think that this world, which is a great deal like the ideal of Western democratic capitalism, um, is on the ascendancy around the world. However, there are challenges to it, and, it, and the challenges sometimes are violent, and the, and the violence has sometimes challenges to it, and, it, and the challenges sometimes are violent, and the, and the violence has sometimes got to be countered. Uh, pacifism simply doesn't work. Someday it may work. Someday we, won't, we may not need police forces, for that matter. We may, we may never need uh, um, uh, jails. But until, until we become angels, we do. And we need a system, and, and to my way of thinking, the system that is represented by, by Europe and by um, Japan and by the United States and by increasingly countries in Latin America is the very best system that, that, that we currently have available and the, that, the, that the, um, the spread of this kind of system, preferably, uh, and no, not preferably, entirely by the free will of the people of the various countries of the world, which is going on at the very, this very moment, and which is what the crisis in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe is all about, will come to pass. And <clears throat> Mr. Kondraki, I knew Woodrow Wilson. I work with Woodrow Wilson. You know Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> the, um, the most coldly and accurately written account of the casualty figures uh, to have appeared in the American press, the one that quoted Schwarzkopf's private briefing to Bush and others and made 100,000 the low estimate for uniform casualties only, was in the Wall Street Journal of uh, the 22nd of March, but I have to disappoint you, it wasn't on the front page, it was on the back page, nonetheless, uh, it was there. Now, um, there are contestants um, in history for the famous saying of an American president when told about the Somoza family in Nicaragua, um, that, boy, he sounds like a real bastard, but at least he's our bastard. I understand that it was actually Franklin Delano Roosevelt who said that. Um, at any rate, that would have been Somoza the Elder, uh, shortly after the burial of Sandino. However, the idea is a familiar one, right? And it, is, it has been part of our critique, those of us on this side of the house, that that feeling about Saddam Hussein was part of the policy. 
surreptitiously remains part of the policy and may become central to the policy, thus that all arguments based on the vile nature of the Saddam Hussein regime that take that as the justification for the war fall under the heading known to you all of the non sequitur. You might do better to listen to George Bush in the first speech that he made uh, when uh, the, after the war had begun, the first time he left Washington to make a public appearance where he said what this war is going to show is that what we say goes, I quote. I regard the Kuwait issue, important as it was and is, as essentially a sideshow. If it was a matter of guaranteeing the borders of Kuwait, the United States Army would obviously not still be in Iraq. This war was fought to show who was boss. That is, in, that is of the first importance, because the discovery of who's boss will depend, as it has in the past, on the awarding of prizes to different proxies for different strategic and regional and colonial purposes. And this may well mean that a regime less democratic, more savage, less developed, and less civilized, in a word, comes to power with American support in Baghdad. Stranger things have certainly happened. Undoubtedly, if that regime is pliable, it will be permitted to flourish because that will be the test. And it is by that test that the war must be judged. It must be judged by the motives, conduct, and intentions and actions of those who fought it. And I would submit that those motives are base enough for me to say that they weren't worth taking a single Iraqi life. And I've never felt more confident and and uh, justified in taking a position than this one. Thank you. For the Wisconsin Union Directorate Ideas and Issues Committee and the Donald B. Albert Forum, thanks very much to Christopher Hitchens and Morton Kondracki. And to all of you for coming this evening. Thank you. That's the program.